Thank you. Um, so we've talked about kind of defining the diseases. Um, so we know that celiac disease, the prevalence of celiac disease is about 1% of the population. Not quite as clear about non-gluten sensitivity. But what we have found are people are purchasing gluten-free items about one-third um, as of um, th this poll was taken in 2013. About one-third of U.S. adults were purchasing or eating gluten-free. So clearly people are eating gluten-free that it's not necessary for them to do so. So why are they doing it? Why are we eating gluten-free? Should we be eating gluten-free? Is that really the healthy diet for everyone? So I always start my talk with this. Please do not start or have a patient start or a relative start. Please do not start the gluten-free diet until all testing has been completed. This is unfortunate what we see frequently in clinic. People have heard about this. They watch Oprah, Dr. Oz. You know, they follow all the latest fads and trends. And if it's good for them, it's good for me, so I'll go gluten-free. They do feel better. Then six months later, they come to us and say, you know, do I have celiac disease? And I have to tell them, unfortunately, I can't answer that question at this point unless you put the gluten back in. And again, when you're feeling well after being feeling sick, this is not a happy thought. So always, always be tested before starting the diet. So we know if, if we're dealing with um, which, which disease we're dealing with and why is that important. So if the treatment is really the same for either one, what, what difference does it make? Well, this young lady decided that she must have a wheat intolerance, and so she was cutting back on wheat because she thought she was probably wheat intolerant. So she finally had so much pain that she went to the emergency room, and guess what? It wasn't wheat intolerance at all. She was pregnant. <laughs> so she delivered this happy, healthy baby. So again, not, not, to, not to scare anybody who's uh, having a little bit of gastrointestinal <laughs> disease that you're actually pregnant. Um, so really, we should check that out before starting the gluten-free diet. So again, it's important to know, um, you know exactly uh, which of the two that we have. So, my, my thought on, on, on the popularity when we started doing this, and I've been working with Dr. Fasano for over 20 years, I know I started when I was 12, um, that, uh, you know, we were trying to get people to recognize gluten-free and trying to get um, healthcare professionals to test for it. We were trying to put the word out there and educate people. And then what happened were manufacturers started to produce foods that were gluten-free. So consumers would walk into a store and they would see a product on the shelf that was labeled gluten-free. Now as a consumer, we're kind of trained that if it's free of something, that something must be bad for you, right? Because we eat salt-free, sugar-free, trans-fat-free, cholesterol-free, calorie-free. So if it's free, 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 then whatever it's free of can't be good for you. So I don't know what this gluten is, but if it's free of it, it's got to be good, right? So people started getting on the bandwagon of this gluten-free product. So they think this must be healthier for you, I can lose weight on it, there must be some benefits to gluten-free. So again, we need to take a look at what are the consequences. So is it healthy for everybody? Should everybody be gluten-free? Should we all be eating, um, taking as, as Dr. Leonard said, this inflammation um, in, do, inducing uh, grain, should we take it out? But again, it's not without consequences. So uh, the whole grains are part of a healthy, well-balanced diet, and they do offer important nutrients to the diet. So just removing them, we can actually get into some nutritional difficulties. So we don't want to do it um, without a good reason behind it. So again, in defense of gluten, so what, what do we have? So it's naturally higher in fiber. It is, um, contains the B vitamin complex. Again, the B vitamins um, are in our whole grains, but once they um, manufacture our white, fluffy Wonder Wheat bread or a nice white pasta or a nice white uh, cereals, the government says, okay, you took those vitamins out, now put them back in. And while you're at it, throw in some folate and throw in some iron. So they're fortified and enriched. So when we pick up a cereal or a bread that's um, been a, then, um, a refined uh, wheat product, it's fortified and enriched. Gluten-free products at this point, not all of them are, few of them are. So again, we're maybe missing out on the, the iron, the thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, um, and folate. 
So again, some of these um, fructin-like resistant starches may actually be healthy for the gut. So these may be making our gut actually happy. Um, and they may actually help to reduce triglyceride levels, some uric acid, LDLs, and may have a positive effect on blood, blood pressure. So again, it's not a, we're not gluten haters, by the way. So we're not, we're not gluten hater people. We kind of like our wheat, but if, you know, so we're not, not anti-wheat people. But again, um, before uh, removing it, we need to think about those things. And a question that we raised, is it more toxic? Is that why we're seeing more people with celiac disease? Why is celiac disease seen on, on the rise? And actually, um, a recently published study showed that, that indeed there is no clear evidence that the gluten content itself in wheat is higher than it had been before. And actually, per capita, we're actually consuming less wheat today than we did back in the 1900s. So it's not that we're eating more wheat or the wheat is more potent, so to speak. Um, so again, clearly we don't have all the answers as to why the, the um, prevalence is increasing. But again, wheat is not more toxic. So again, back to why do we need to know the difference between gluten sensitivity and the gluten-free diet or um, uh, celiac disease. Again, as I said, the treatment is basically the same. We're both going to follow um, a gluten-free diet. That's the only treatment we have at this time for either condition. So we don't, we have some things on the horizon, but nothing is, is uh, close to, to being on the market. We do know that a gluten-free diet has to be less than 10 milligrams per day in order for uh, there to be no damage to the gut. And we're not as clear on gluten sensitivity. Do you have to be that strict? Do you have to be stricter? Can you be more lenient? Um, what, is, what is your dose on that? We know that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease is lifelong, so you're never going to be able to um, go uh, without the diet. We don't know the same for gluten sensitivity. Can, can you um, tolerate gluten at some later point? And we don't know. Symptoms improve on both. And what are the, um, the consequences of non-compliance? Very serious for celiac disease. So again, if somebody is not diagnosed with celiac disease, just thinks they have a wheat intolerance, so, oh, if I have that pizza and I have a stomach ache the next day, I can get over it. You know, it's worth it, you know, because it was a really good pizza. So again, if, it, um, if you cheat, um, not because you don't know if you have celiac disease, um, it could be very problematic down the road. So what, what are gluten-containing ingredients? So what things do we have to remove? So where, where is the gluten? So obviously we are all familiar with wheat. So of course it's in wheat, barley, and rye. And from barley comes malt and brewer's yeast. So those are the key components um, that we need to avoid. So that sounds pretty easy. So that's pretty easy, easy right? Just take out, some, take out some bread, take out some pasta, you know, what's the big deal? Okay, without looking at your papers, turn your papers over. You'll be quizzed on this and see you can't leave the room until you get 100 on this. So let's see how easy this is. Which of these foods usually contain gluten? So should you eat a veggie burger or a beef burger? Okay, right. Because the veggie burger usually has wheat protein added to it. So there is wheat in, in the veggie burger. So again, not as obvious. So if you have that sweet tooth, would you, should you eat licorice or plain toffee? Toffee. So you, I have to stay away from the uh, Twizzlers. Twizzlers has wheat in it. So again, and a little sneaky. Um, so is, who's going to contain gluten? The holiday sauce or teriyaki sauce? Teriyaki sauce. You all cheated, I think. <laughs> so teriyaki sauce, um, soy sauce, is highly likely to contain wheat. Um, spelt or buckwheat? Spelt. Again, buckwheat has nothing to do with wheat. It's actually a member of the rhubarb family. So again, buckwheat is, is okay, gotcha. So should you be drinking whiskey or beer if whiskey. you want to stay away from gluten? Which one should you be drinking? Whiskey. So, ooh, there was a lot of confidence in that one. I like that. There was a lot of conviction. Yes. Beer or whiskey. Okay. Uh, ketchup or malt vinegar? Which has which would have gluten in it? Malt vinegar. 
malt vinegar. Snickers or Milky Way? Which one would have gluten in it? Milky. Now, for Halloween, I give out Skittles. They're gluten free, which is of no consequence. Um, but I don't like them. But I love my Snickers. So, um, Milky Way does have malt in it. So, again, not an obvious source of gluten. But uh, my trick-or-treaters uh, were able to get uh, the Skittles, and I saved myself from eating a bag of uh, Snickers by not buying them. So scalloped potatoes or risotto? Which would have gluten? Yeah. Scalloped potatoes. Very good. All right, you all passed. You're, you're completed this most intense part of the program. <laughs> so again, it's... it's it's, it's not just the obvious. It really requires a lot of label reading, a lot of looking to see where, what foods, what contains gluten in them. Like I said, the Twizzlers. Um, communion wafers. We have a lot of people who um, have come in very, very sick and don't understand why they're not feeling well, and they're still taking the wheat-based communion wafers. So again, we can, we can turn that, you know, suggest the gluten-free um, reduced gluten wafers for them. But Would there be more than 10 milligrams in one? In a, in a regular wheat, yes. Oh. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So you do want to use the special um, low gluten wafers if you, if you have celiac disease. Huh. All right, so again, um, if you're reading labels to know if a product is gluten free or you're helping patients to discuss gluten free, because of the Food Allergy Labeling Consumer Protection Act, which says if any of the top eight allergens are used in any way, shape, or form in a product, they have to be English on the label. Wheat is one of those um, allergens. So if wheat is used in any of the above ingredients, it must be called out under the contained statement. It must say contains wheat or listed in plain English next to the ingredients. So if it's modified food starch or dextrin and seasoning, whatever it is, you know those long names on our food labels that we don't know how to pronounce, we've got numbers after them, you know, you don't have to worry about them because if they came from wheat, made from wheat, it would say wheat. So the first place to start is looking at the contained statement for the word wheat, okay? Wheat is the only gluten-containing grain covered under the rule. The other two grains, the barley, um, are, is not. Um, covered under that. So again, you have to read the ingredient list. It is an ingredient. It will be there if it's in there. So you have to read for barley and rye. And again, from barley comes malt. Malt is widely used in breakfast cereals, so regular Rice Krispies, Rice Krispie treats, corn flakes. Even though they're rice and corn, they're not gluten-free because they contain malt. Brewer's yeast is actually a byproduct of beer production, so they use the spent yeast and use it as a flavoring agent in some meat and soup products. If it's not labeled gluten-free, the oats themselves can be highly contaminated with barley and wheat. So um, products that aren't labeled gluten-free, so if it's a granola blend, those oats would be too highly contaminated and shouldn't be used. So only gluten, labeled gluten-free oats should be used. So again, we talked a little bit about the benefits of wheat and where wheat is. So if we go gluten-free, these are some key nutrients that we may be missing. So it's important to look for balance in the diet and the foods that we're eating in the diet so we can avoid some of these nutritional pitfalls. So lack of fiber, lack of iron. Again, remember, um, we're, not, we're not fortifying or enriching um, some of the, the products with the, with the B vitamin calcium, phosphorus, and zinc can all be missing um, in, in a gluten-free diet if not well balanced. Because gluten-free products traditionally have always been made with starches and refined, uh, refined flours like refined rice flours and starches and gums um, type of thing, the tapioca, the potato. These things are uh, very low fiber and uh, don't have the added uh, vitamins or nutrients to them. In addition to make them taste better, they're also adding a lot of oils, a lot of fat, um, sugar, you know, some of the other things that they're adding to them to, to try and get the mouthfeel and the taste. Gluten-free foods have come a very, very long way since when I started. So when I started, the joke with Dr. Fasano and I was we were a little bit confused when it came to the early gluten-free products because we weren't quite sure if you should eat the bread or the box that it came in, because they tasted very similar. They're very heavy, 
dense, crumbly. You could not make a sandwich. You could pretend to put something between two slices of bread and then it would just crumble in your hands. It had to be toasted. And even when it was toasted, it was still really difficult to, to, to swallow. So early on, the, the gluten-free products were really pretty miserable. But fast forward to today, um, the products are amazing. Um, so again, there shouldn't be anybody eating a product that doesn't taste good. Um, the manufacturing process that they go through, they're using more um, whole grains, they're using other techniques, they're trying to reduce the fat and sugar content, trying to boost the fiber content. So a lot of today's products are actually very good tasting. So no one should be eating something that doesn't taste good just because that's all they have. So they have great tasting pizza, great tasting breads. Um, the, the market is quite full of some really good tasting product. Um, so again, the nutritional deficiencies that we would be concerned about, um, anemia, um, again, supplements <clears throat> may be required. Again, some information about how to increase iron in foods. Uh, low uh, bone mineral density, so again, we always uh, recommend a DEXA be done when they're first diagnosed and follow them with DEXAs to see if the um, absorption of calcium and vitamin D has interfered with the bone density. And it's ironic that a lot of people follow it to lose weight when one of the big complaints I get from patients is weight gain. So again, if you're eating a gluten-free brownie, don't fool yourself to think, oh, but it's gluten-free. So I can eat the whole box, but in the wheat brownies I can't eat. So again, the calories are the same, if not more, in the, um, in the gluten-free products. If you take these um, extras out and you eat you know, whole fresh foods, um, and you rely on fresh fruits and vegetables and natural uh, grains and such, you know, if you eat a healthier diet, that may help you lose weight, but adding those gluten-free brownies definitely is not. Um, constipation can be an issue. Um, again, if you're decreasing the fiber in the diet, um, constipation could be a problem. So in a survey of, uh, for reasons why people are non-compliant, because you can understand now, this is, this is difficult, this is complicated. Um, it is very restrictive. So again, I'm not only worried about those foods that we talked about, but those foods cannot come in contact with gluten-containing foods. So you can't take a hamburger off a bun, or you just can't pick the croutons out of a salad. You need to cook or to do your toast in a separate toaster. So your gluten-free food cannot come in contact with gluten-containing food. So this raises a, a lot of issues, especially when eating in a restaurant and somebody else is doing the cooking, especially with the holidays and, and Aunt Mary's in the, cook, in the kitchen cooking up a storm. So what is she doing in there? So again, there's really no cheating. There's no, there's no um, break from it. So again, if you cheat, you're going to suffer some consequences. Again, um, especially during the holidays, think about how difficult it is when you think about what's on your Thanksgiving plate. You know, again, you've got your stuffing, your mac and cheese, and your pies, and you know, the green bean casserole. All of those things, and all the gathering, and all of those foods are gluten-containing and need to be modified or left out. It's expensive. The gluten-free products can be three to five times more expensive than their wheat counterpart. And a big reason why I don't encourage families, because if they have if it's one member of the family who has to follow a gluten-free diet, I don't recommend that the whole family go gluten-free. It's just too expensive. You know, there's no reason for teenage boys and men to be eating a gluten-free bread if they don't have celiac disease. That money could be better spent on your kid's college education, because you're going to need it for that. So again, it, you know, it is very expensive to, to follow those. Um, some people do think it's tasteless. Again, I think the taste quality has, um, has improved. And for some populations, um, elderly, or if you have trouble reading a food label, um, this can be a, um, a, quite a big challenge. So again, wrapping quickly, these are just some general suggestions. Again, no different than what the, um, the, uh, uh, what the general American public should be eating. We should all be eating, like, eating more fresh fruits and vegetables. You should be eating more whole grains. Uh, lean proteins, again, looking for, for some of these, you know, including the non-dairy foods, less on the processed foods, so there's no, there's no starting re revelations here. Again, the whole grains 
are going to provide you with some of those missing nutrients um, that we see. So again, um, I think a, a plus size side for celiac disease, we've kind of introduced some of the um, whole grains, the ancient grains again. So the amaranth, um, again, these um, are really nutrition little powerhouses. So if you don't have celiac disease or any gluten intolerance, I still recommend that you investigate some of these amaranth, the millet, um, you know, and the quinoa. Quinoa is a complete protein. I think quinoa has kind of come into fashion. It's, it's more fashionable now to, to include some of these things. But there's a lot of nutritional benefits. Um, sorghum, one of the, the biggest benefits there is that's what they make gluten-free beer out of. So that's, that's an important one to know. <laughs> um, and of course, chaff. So some of these aren't familiar to us. I didn't know what the heck they were when I first started. I couldn't pronounce them. I don't know what they were. What do you do with them? But again, um, it would be worth um, everyone to take advantage of some of these ancient grains and put them in. And we just wanted to mention we have over probably 20 ongoing trials um, for children and adults with celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, we're working to look for biomarkers to help distinguish patients that have um, mucosal healing after they're on a gluten-free diet versus those that don't. Um, one of our most exciting studies, which is an international multi-center trial, is one that's following infants with a first-degree family member with celiac disease over a five-year time period. We collect blood, stool, and a lot of clinical information, um, and that's to try and uncover that other factor that tips someone over into developing autoimmune disease. So we've been working to recruit um, 500 infants. We are at 264 infants. So if you have family members with celiac disease and anyone expecting, um, please send them over to our website where we have all the information.